Let's turn into our Bibles to John chapter 14. How do I get to heaven? How do I get to heaven? You know, everyone here tonight, I believe I know each and every one of you, and everyone here tonight is, is true, oh, I believe, is a born-again Christian. You never know who comes to a church service, and so when you pick a topic or when you pick a scripture text or God allows you to have something to, to do, you never know who's going to be here or who's going to watch in our time on Facebook or upon uh, YouTube, who's going to watch. But in John, the 14th chapter, verse 1 through 6, Jesus gives his apostles one of the most unique sermons about heaven. We see that just before his betrayal, during his last Passover Seder meal on the earth, Jesus reveals his most intimate words about heaven. Heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. Understand that. Keep that in your heart and memorize it, that heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. The people are prepared by their faith, by believing and trusting and receiving Christ. Here in the first verse of chapter 14, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. It sounds like Jesus is speaking to believers here, believe those who believe in him as their Lord and Savior. They're in a Passover meal in an upper room, and those are the, they are the guests of, of a, a person who owns a very large home. Again, by tradition, most people believe that this is the house of John Mark's family, that his mom and dad gave them this opportunity to use the upper room for their Passover. And so we see that more than likely he's speaking to, to Christians, speaking to those who have the understanding of what heaven is and are going there themselves. And so we see that speaking about going to heaven is not just for lost people. Evangelism is a wonderful thing, but it's not just to be used for lost people. That there are times that you and I need to remember. There are times that you and I need to understand what heaven is all about. So let's take a look, first of all, about the true details of heaven. How do I get to heaven? Let's start with verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And so we see that, first of all, the true details of heaven, and we see the true direction to heaven. Jesus reveals some very interesting things about heaven. You know, the Bible doesn't reveal everything about heaven. I believe that God allows for you and I to have some excitement when we get to heaven, that we're going to see things perhaps our language can't even describe. But here we see that Jesus begins to give the true details of heaven. He calls heaven his father's house. Heaven is a place of provision, as we see in verse 2. It is a place of parental provision. He said, in my father's house. In my father's house, which means that God the father has a desire for you and I to come to his house that he has prepared a place for us. The Bible says, in my father's house are many mansions. Now, there are many different types of, of translations. It would translate that many rooms. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 26, it talks about the rooms of heaven. We don't know if they're actual huge mansions or if in an aspect that there are these buildings in heaven that we have a part of. But we see that he says, in my father's house are many mansions or many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. 
We see a place of parental provision, a place for God's family, the Father's house. Oh, I remember there was safety in the Father's house. When I was a young man and I would uh, work out and, and have my athletic uh, workout at nighttime, I would many times go home in the dark and I would have to go through a, a, uh, a park, a very wooded park. And so I just knew there was some snarling thing behind the tree as I was running through that at dead speed. If someone would have jumped out behind the tree, I would have probably ran straight up him, broke his neck as I went on the other side and gone on. He'd never have caught me for sure. But you see, there was always something about getting to the father's house. And when I would get to the doorknob and I'd grab the doorknob, I just knew I heard this, the, the seething sound in the back of my neck. I felt the breath of the evil thing that was following me. And I would open the door and close it behind me as quick as I could. And there was a peace and strength there. And I think that's part of what Jesus is talking about. That in our Father's house it is a place for family. It's a place for comfort. It's a place for security. Only those in God's family have assurance of heaven. There are many people that you meet in the world today as you begin to talk to them about this place called heaven. And you ask them, are you going to heaven? And they always answer this. And if they answer it this way, you got some work to do. They always say, well, I hope I do. And my question is very simply, why do you only hope? How come you don't know? I had a dear friend, he's in heaven today. He, he was a wonderful, wonderful evangelist. Now, he never went on evangelist meetings, but he had the gift of evangelism. And he could do all, I mean, he was unbelievable about talking to people about heaven. We'd get on an elevator and he'd walk in and he would not turn around and face the other. He'd look at everybody there. And he'd say to them this simple thing. He'd say, are you going up? Now, if you're on the bottom floor of the building and you're getting up in an elevator, you only got one way, either the basement or you're going up. And he would say, and they would say, oh, yeah, we're going up. He said, well, no, I'm, I'm asking about heaven. Are you going up to heaven? And he had some very interesting ways of, of talking about heaven. I think Tom had a understanding of heaven that your average person doesn't have. There was a place for God's family. We're going to a house. And there's a place of godly fortification. Heaven is a secure place. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 3 and 4, it says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no pain, for the former things have passed away. There's a place of security. There won't be any pandemics in heaven. There won't be any masks worn in heaven. There won't be any booster shots in heaven. You won't have to worry about any clinics in heaven, no hospitals in heaven, no funeral homes in heaven. No cemeteries in heaven. We see that it's a safe place to live. Heaven is a place for the family. <clears throat> I think every father and mother tried to make their home a place of security for their family. And it is a secure thing, and it is a thing that brings great comfort to us to understand that we have a heavenly father. And that he has an ability to, to reach out to us and give us this concept so that we can have an understanding of some sort about what heaven is going to be like. We see a very, a very secure place of heaven. And then we see it's also a place of plentiful provision. It says in verse 2, in my father's house are many mansions. Jesus didn't say, guys, there's only a few, so I hope you get in on this bus because we're going to get there pretty soon. And if they're all sold out, we're not going to be able to uh, uh, put you up. But what we understand that there are many mansions. God has provided a place in heaven for every human being ever born on the face of the earth. 
I believe that God had created heaven for a place for all men and women to live with him. It's a place of godly fortification, yes, but it's a scale, the scale of his love is very simple. John 3.16 says that for God so loved the world. Well, if he so loved the world, why would he create a place that could not fit the world in? If God knew that death was coming for every man, woman, boy, or child, why is it that God would not would create a place <clears throat> that would only house a few people? Why would God do that? In fact, God would, would give an opportunity for every human pe person ever born on the face of the earth in every clime and every place and every nation and every continent that they would be able to come to heaven. We see a scale of his love for God so loved the world and because of that, he created an opportunity of a mansion for each and every person. And then he gave the scope of his love in John 3, 16. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth, didn't say just a few, didn't say just a special country, didn't say just a, a group of certain people, it didn't say just to those on the, the, the east side of, of the globe or the south side of the globe, but rather he said that whosoever Believeth. That means we have a choice, does it not? I shared with you this morning that we must remember that the freedom that we have, that the freedom that you and I enjoy in the country that you and I live in was not given to us by, by any law passed by man, but rather was given to us by God. And God, therefore, has given us a freedom of choice. Each and every one of us have that freedom of choice. No matter where we were born, no matter where we live, we have a choice of whether we want to receive God or not receive him. The Bible says that whosoever believeth, that's a choice. And so we see that this place of plentiful provision, we see the scale of his love, that he loved the world, but we also see the scope of his love, that whosoever there's not a certain group of people God says, I'll never save them. There's not a certain group of people that God says, I'll never give them an opportunity. But we see this place of plentiful provision. And then we see that heaven is also a place of personal provision. Not only is it God opening it up for the whole world, but beloved, you can place your name in John 3, 16. For God so loved John Blair that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Because we see here in verse 2, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. That's pretty personal. He didn't say, I go to prepare a place for everybody. He didn't say, I go to prepare a place for Americans. I didn't go, I go to prepare a place for South Americans. I didn't go to prepare a place for Chinese. But rather, he says, for you. That makes heaven a very personal place. You know, I, I used to travel a lot in Jacksonville, Florida, in the first few years of my, my ministry there in, in the church on staff. And there were times that I would do a lot of, of bereavement calls and I would go to different homes all over the, all over the city. And then occasionally I would go in some of these gated communities and I would have to get permission to get into them. And so I would pull up to the guardhouse and tell them who I was and who I was going to, to make a visit with. Do you know how to get there? Yes, I have directions. I just need permission from you to get in. Yeah, well, you're allowed to go in. So I'd go in, and as I was driving around to find the house, I would notice on the lawn there, there was a placard that said the home of Dr. and Mrs. Smith or uh, the home of Mr. and Mrs. Jones. And, and as I would travel around, occasionally I would see uh, the, the uh, plaque that would say the future home. It would be a, it would be a, just a lot there and they would look like they were building and it says the future home of, of Mr. and Mrs. Tom, uh, Frank or whatever, you know. And it was a very interesting thing and it just dawned on me as I was driving around. I wonder if in heaven they got a sign on the, on the lawn of my house saying the future home of John Blair. 
You know, and when, when the Lord comes to get me, when the Lord comes to take me, does he say to a couple angels, go and get that plaque on the, on the yard and put there the home of John Blair? Oh, beloved, I think it's just as real as that. I think it's just as real because God has promised me, just as he's promised you. I go to prepare a place for you. Oh, folks, this is not this is not some science fiction thing. This is not some force. This is not some may the force be with you deal. But rather, this is I'm going to prepare a place for you. And how more personal can that be? And so we see that heaven is real and heaven is very personal for you and for me. It is a prepared place. Heaven was not if heaven was not real, Jesus would have told us, would he not? We see again in, in verse 2, he says, If it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus said, if this was not real, if this was not true, I would have told you it was not true. I would have told you it wasn't real. But he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. So it is a prepared place, and it's also, again, a very personal place. He is an eyewitness, beloved. He and the Father and the Holy Spirit created heaven. They created all things. They created all the angels. But what we see here is that heaven is a real place. And then we see in verse 3, heaven is a place of promises. I, I like that. I like that God has promised us many things in the Bible. But we see here in verse 3, he promises something very unique. He says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Now that's very, very personal because he says to again, if I go prepare a place, I will come again and receive you to myself. Again, very personal. He doesn't say, I'm going to get a whole boatload up here and I'm going to meet you at the dock. He doesn't say, I'm going to meet there at the train station and get all of you out of the train station in here or the, or the bus is coming. I'll be getting a whole bus load up here. But he says, I'm going to meet you. I'll receive you to myself. We see a promise by his words. Why? Because he told us so. He told you, I'm going to meet you there. You know, there are a lot of people that have these out-of-the-body experiences that talk about how they see family members in heaven. And some of them say they even see Jesus. But I've, I had a book years ago, I don't know what happened to it, but years ago it was called the, the Dying Words of the Lost and Saved, and it was written back in the 1800s, and it was a fascinating book. This was pre all the different medications and drugs that they gave people, so when they died, they're just literally laying there in a stupor. But this is when people were awake and this is where people were really alive until they closed their eyes in mortal slumber. And they would say things like, I see the family members and I see this or I see that. Oh, beloved, we have a real place. It's a promise by his words he told us. And then it was a promise by his works. What kind of works did Jesus do to promise us heaven? What is the big issue of our life? The number one enemy of mankind is death. Oh, beloved, we can overcome a lot of things in this world. We can overcome financial problems. We can overcome wars and different aspects. We can overcome diseases. We can overcome sicknesses. But there's one thing that when it comes to us, and comes to knock on our door, you and I have no power over it whatsoever, and that is death. You and I will succumb to death one day if Jesus doesn't come soon. Now, I don't like to talk about things like that. I don't like to, to it, it doesn't give me any, any joy to share this matter about death with you. But folks, that's a reality of life, that death comes to each and every one of us. And the reason why I'm saying that is because Jesus gave us the answer to this matter called death. And that is everlasting life. And he proved it to us when he walked out of that tomb. He said, I've come to give you life and give it to you abundantly. 
And that's exactly what he did. Jesus came and changed everything in this world about the matter of death. Death was a reality. When Adam and Eve went out into the field and found their dead son out in the field and buried him in the earth and had that first uh, funeral there upon the earth, they understood that the penalty of sin was death. And when Jesus came to forgive us of our sins, Yes, death is going to come to us, beloved, but there is life after death. And Jesus proved that to us and told us to that and showed us by his own resurrection that you and I can have that resurrection promise of Jesus. And then we see also in verse 3, it's a promise of personal redemption. I will receive you unto myself. I will receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. I like that very much. That I will receive you unto myself. Through the release of my soul, death is a, an exit, but it is also an entrance. You and I, in this point, in this world in which you and I live in, we only see the exit. We only see the going. We only see the leaving. We don't see the arrivals we don't see the entrance i've shared with people at funerals for years if i could open a portal of glory and let you see what your loved ones going through through you wouldn't cry one bit you would not have one aspect of of uh, of sadness but if we could see what they saw if we could see what they're seeing right now so we see here that through this release of our soul, death comes and takes us. And either we go to an exit into everlasting life in heaven, or we go to an exit in everlasting hell. And then there's the also as Christians in, in, uh, of, of Christians in the last days, there is that possibility that the rapture is going to come. And I've heard many people over through the years have said, you know, that rapture means we will not have any death. And I don't agree with that. I believe the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die and after that to judgment. I believe death comes to all. But in the rapture, that death is so quick and so sudden that our bodies won't even hit the ground when we're changed into the resurrection form of Christ. I believe you and I will be resurrected and changed there before our bodies hit the ground as we are taken to be with the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, the Bible says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And so we see there is a promise of, of a, a personal, a personal redemption. Oh, beloved, you and I are going to leave this old place. We're going to go into a place called heaven as we've been looking into for the last few weeks, we're going to go to that place that maker is not by human hands as Abraham was there on his journey looking for that city where no human hand had made. You and I are going to meet with people. We're going to see those apostles who are there already. We're going to see the great men and women of history. We're going to see those who are born again Christians. We're going to see those who were believers in, in Jehovah God, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all of that. We're going to be taken to that place of redemption. And then we also see in verse 3, it's a promise of personal restoration. Where I am, there you may be also. You see, Jesus' aspect about heaven is very simple. It is a personal promise of inclusion. Jesus promises us that we're included in the family of God. You know, there are places that I'm not welcome to. There are places that certain people, whether it be their color or whether it be their race or whether it be their uh, you know, ethnicity or whatever they are, they're not welcome. 
But let me say this to you, folks. If, if all any of those aspects are a problem with you, you're going to have a difficulty in heaven. There's going to be all kinds of people in heaven. You know, when I was in Jacksonville, Florida, we had people from everywhere in that church. We had a Russian church. We had a Chinese church. We had an African church. We had all kinds of different people. And when once a year we get together for the, for the chest of Joash, it looked like the United Nations had gathered in our church. And we'd all come down there and put our, our offering and our, and our pledge in the chest. And man, I remember one time standing there and getting ready to go down. And I watched everybody go down and thinking, man, this is, is exactly what heaven is going to be like. We see a promise of personal restoration. It's a promise of inclusion. No one, no one, everyone has the opportunity. No one will be left out. And then we see Jesus' personal promise of inheritance. You see, Jesus personally comes for us. Jesus personally comes and calls us by name, and he takes us and gives us our inheritance, which is heaven. Turn in your Bibles to John, the 12th chapter. A little bit to your left, and look at verse 26. John 12, 26. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him, my father, will honor. Oh, folks, listen. What you do for Christ, what you do for Jesus, what you do for the kingdom yet to come, God is going to honor you with that. God is going to bring great honor to you that there in heaven he's going to bestow it upon you. Turn to Matthew chapter 16 and verse 27. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 27. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 27. Matthew chapter 16. And verse 27. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his work. Oh, beloved, we have a promise that when we get to heaven, it's not just getting to heaven and we got to go through a, a, a process center. We're not going to go to heaven just to go there and say, well, okay, we, we're going to be putting you through some remedial classes. You got to have some problems there. You're going to have to learn Hebrew, first of all. So we're going to take you through Hebrew classes. Or you need to go through this and that. And so we're going to do this and we're going to let you have all this. No, the Bible says that each and every one of us are going to be rewarded by God himself. Heaven is a place of restoration. It's a place of reward. It's a place of inheritance. It's a place that you and I should look forward to going. Oh, beloved, every individual I've ever read about, every individual who ever has had these out of bodies experience going to heaven, they always say the same thing. I didn't want to come back. I didn't want to come back. Oh, beloved, think about that. A taste of glory. An opportunity to see what is yet ahead and then have to come back. I don't know if that's not cruel. I don't know what, what that is for some people. Paul had that issue. And I think Paul, when he came back from his experience in, in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I think when Paul came back, he saw all the things in heaven, saw things he said were, was, it was inexpressible. It was unlawful to talk about, he said. And I believe that Paul was given that opportunity because of the road Paul had to travel yet ahead. That I think when Paul was beaten with rods, he saw the finish line. When Paul was shipwrecked and there he was on the coast and there he was washed up on the shore, sputtering out that old seawater, I think Paul saw there the finish line of heaven. I think Paul, when he was stoned and left for dead there on the road to, to Derby, I think Paul saw the finish line. And I think we need to understand, beloved, there is a finish line one day. 
and there is an inheritance when we get there. Oh, there's not going to be a place, folks, where people are going to be ashamed. I believe it's going to be a place where we're going to be welcomed. And I think it's going to be a place where we're going to love God. And then we see in verses 4 through 6 in John chapter 14, we see the true direction to heaven. There's only one way to heaven, beloved. It's not the many roads to Rome. It's not the many roads to all the different places. There's only one way to heaven. Years ago when I was speaking at a, at a synagogue, being in a very large church, they they call and say, hey, would you come to our synagogue? Will you come to our church? We'd like to know a little bit about what's going on. And on two occasions, I was able to go to the synagogue and able to share the good news with others. On one occasion, I had a young man ask me, so you're telling me that my grandmother is in hell with Adolf Hitler. And you're telling me if I don't receive your Jesus that I'm going to go to hell too. And I looked at that young man and I said to him, no, I'm not telling you that whatsoever. I said, listen to me, listen to me very, quick, quick, uh, very carefully. I said, you look like a good young man. I like you. I said, about your personality or just something about you, I like you. He said, would you let me date your daughter? I said, it's a different story, but anyway. <laughs> and I said to him, look, I'm not telling you you have to accept my Jesus uh, to go to heaven. But I am telling you that your Messiah did. Your, your Messiah, Jesus, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh in the Father but by me. I didn't say that, but your Jewish Messiah did. And there was a hush on the room. And oh, there was some more talking later on, but I didn't get invited back. But anyway, I did get an opportunity one time. It was very interesting. God gives us opportunities to get people to go to heaven. I had an opportunity. They called our church and said, we'd like to have someone come on Saturday and speak to our congregation. Well, I'm thinking a Christian organization be no problem. I'll go. And it was a black organization, a black church. I thought, well, hey, that's no problem. I'll go too. So I went to the area down there. And when I went in, I came in and they're all wearing uh, prayer shawls. They're all wearing yarmulkes. And it, I found out it was a, a black synagogue. And what had I prepared but a message about the sacrifices of the Old Testament leading all the way up to Jesus, who was the Pleistos, the Seus, there in the book of Hebrews, when talking about the greatest of all of sacrifices, that all those sacrifices all the way back to Abraham pictured Jesus as he came. And these people's eyes, they were, they were glued on me. It was unbelievable. We have an opportunity, folks, to share people all over this world how they can go to heaven. We see Jesus' affirmation of candor in verse 4, an announcement of Christ. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Jesus was not just being philosophical. He was not just being, you know, talking about things. He knew they knew. But old Thomas, he had a question. We see here that heaven is Christian's place. He says, you know it. I know where I go, you know, and the way you know. Jesus knew they knew. And always remember that heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. You and I have been prepared from the foundation of the world. You and I have been prepared for thousands and thousands of years to be in that place. God has seated us, uh, seated us in heavenly places. But what we must understand, like Thomas, sometimes we just don't know it. We see heaven has Christ's presence there. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 8, it says, We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You know, there were times I talked to my dad, and my dad said, I may not wake up in the morning. And I said, well, Dad, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He says, I know. And there are times, some, when I really do look forward to that. And I said, well, Dad, one day I'll get the call, and they'll tell me you, 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 didn't, you didn't make it, but I know you did. 
I know you got there. We see that heaven is a place not only for Christians, but it's a place of Christ's presence. We're not going to be there alone. We're going to have our lovely Savior there. In verse 5, we see the answer of confusion. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Oh, I think Jesus must have really thought in himself, boy, Thomas, how long do I have to be here till you get it? But see, oh, Thomas had an admission of ignorance. We don't know everything about heaven. We don't know everything about what's going on. Sometimes we might speculate. We might think, people have asked me for years, are there animals in heaven? Well, at least horses. The Bible says we're going to come out of heaven and go to the earth riding on horses. So I guess if there's horses, there's other animals too. I don't know. That's a speculation. Otherwise, I don't know of any other animals in heaven. Do you? We see here that, that Thomas had an admission of ignorance. But you know, ignorance is not always bad. Sometimes there are things we need not to know. I believe we don't need to know our death date. I believe if you and I knew our death date, we'd wait to the day before to do anything we wanted to do, wouldn't we? Man, we'd get us a charge card and go absolutely crazy, wouldn't we? Oh, it's just like the rapture. Who knows when the rapture comes? We don't know. I don't know. And I'm glad we don't because it would be that same thing. Christians would wait to the last day before they would witness to people. And people would not get saved until they knew it was the last day. And so let me say this to you. Ignorance is not always a problem. But we see Thomas's analysis of importance. He asked the right question, but he asked it to the right person. <laughs> he went to the source. He went to the one who was preparing the place for him. Psalm 27, 11 says, Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Oh, that could have been Thomas's answer to Jesus. Oh, Thomas could have quoted that scripture in Psalms to him. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a smooth path. Oh, Thomas could have said, Lord, you know the way. Show it to me. And so we see that Jesus has had an affirmation of candor. In verse 6, we see Jesus' assertion of certainty. And Jesus said to him, said to old Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We see, first of all, the credentials of Christ here in verse 6. This is the sixth I am in the book of John. The name I am is very interesting. Jesus says here in verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way. I don't believe this was just a sentence structure that Jesus was using. I think he was pronouncing that holy name that Moses heard there at the burning bush in near Sinai. When Moses asked of God there in that burning bush, whom am I to say is sending me, God? And God said, I am is sending you. And that's why Jesus said on many occasions in John, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. And so we see here, Jesus said, I am the way. God is the way. We see he is the road to heaven. He is the only way to heaven. Ephesians 2.18 says, For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Only through Jesus can we go to heaven. And so we see that he's showing Thomas the way that he already knows the way, and that way is Jesus. And so we see in verse 6, the way. And then he is the reality of heaven. He says in verse 6, I am the way, the truth, the truth. He is the king of glory, and only he knows the truth of heaven. We see in John 1, 17, Jesus said, For the law was given through Moses, but grace... And truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way, yes, he is the only way. You can't go to heaven any other way. 
There is no other way. There is no religion. There is no philosophy. There is no other way to heaven. Only Jesus. And he is the truth. And then also he is the restoration of heaven. He is the only source of life. The Bible says in verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you see in this declaration, Jesus put to rest the erroneous belief that there are many roads to heaven. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh the Father except through me. What he was saying to the world is all these other religions are counterfeit. All these other ways are wrong. Jesus said there are two roads to heaven. Or excuse me, there are two roads in life after death. There's the narrow road and there is the broad way. And he said the narrow road is the way to heaven. And then we see the condition of Christ in verse 6. The Bible says, no one comes to the Father except through me. The condition of Christ is simple. We note his prohibition. How can God send anyone to hell? How can God send any person to hell? In reality, they do, he does not send any person to hell. The Bible says that God would wish that everyone would come to repentance. He wants no one to die. But we see that it is their choice. They choose to reject Christ. They choose hell instead of heaven. So we know this prohibition where he says in verse 6, no one comes to the Father except through me. But we also note his priority. His priority is simple. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Oh, beloved, there's no other name. There's no other name. You can't go through Buddha. You can't go through Muhammad. You can't go through all the different people, these false prophets and people all through the years have come on the scene. You can't go to heaven through them, only through Jesus. John, the 10th chapter. John, the 10th chapter in verse 7. The Bible says, then Jesus said to them again, most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And all who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door, and if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go out, will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Heaven, remember, heaven is a prepared place for a prepared person. The obvious question is, am I prepared? No other answer but yes will suffice. Well, I think so. I hope so. Those won't suffice. It's an I know so relationship with Jesus. How can I find the way? That's a good question. Jesus is the way. There's no other answer that will suffice. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, the Bible says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. He starts, first of all, saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. It's the resolve of the Savior. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And then if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, that's the, that is the response of the sinner's. Romans 10, 13 says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then finally, I'll give, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me is the redemption of salvation. And that's Acts 2, 21. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want to close tonight with a couple of paragraphs from a, from a, a little pamphlet from Billy Graham. It's entitled, On Course to Heaven. Here's what it reads. When the American astronauts astonished the human race with their spectacularly successful first visit to the moon, they took the Apollo 11 on a very narrow trajectory through space. 
Only the tiniest margin for deviation was permitted, and flight corrections were made periodically through that historical voyage. Now suppose that NASA Control Center in Houston had received the word from Apollo 11 that the astronauts were off course, and Houston had replied, oh, that's all right. There are a number of roads leading to heaven or to moon. Just keep on the way you're going. You and I know that they would have kept going, but they would have never come back. People today don't like the word narrow. But Jesus said there were two roads to the future life for all of us. There were two decisions, heaven and hell. And he taught that the way to hell and destruction is broad, but the way to heaven is narrow, and there are few who find it. Christ did not divide men and women into a rich, poor, black or white, or educated and uneducated. He divided them into those on the broad road, which heads toward destruction, and those on the narrow road leading to eternal life. And then he asked the question, which road are you on? What an understanding, what a way to close out a study of heaven, to know that you and I are going to a place that is real. You and I are going to a place where our family members have already gone. Many of our family members that we have buried over the years are already there and been there and waiting for us. And oh, beloved, think about it. You and I have that glorious journey one day that as we travel down this narrow road, it goes into a place where the whole world could have gone, but they chose to go a different direction. Oh, beloved, I pray for you each and every day. And I pray that there would be those in our church that if indeed they are not saved, that they would be saved. And I pray for those who visit that they would be saved. And I pray for family members and friends of this church that they would be saved and would ask that you would do the same. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this study you have given us in this matter of heaven. And oh, Father, we thank you, we praise you, we give you honor and glory that you have provided a place like this for us, that you sent your son Jesus into an old wicked world, a world of sorrow, a world of sadness, and you brought into this world the light of the world that we might find the hope of glory. And oh, Father God, we thank you for your love and your mercy and grace. And if there be anyone here tonight or anyone watching on YouTube, oh, Father God, let this be their opportunity tonight. Help them to understand that we're all born sinners. We're all in that same boat. And oh, Father God, that boat is sinking. Death is coming. And oh, help us to understand that there are those of us who are in the boat who have that life preserver. Though death is coming, we have the life preserver of Jesus who promised us eternal life. And oh, Father God, let those who have not received Jesus, who have not been given the promise of eternal life in heaven, that they would understand this, this wonderful good news of Jesus, that he came as the Son of God, to die for each and every one of our sins. He paid the price for them. He paid the penalty, Father. And we thank you and we praise your holy name. And that those in this old boat that's sinking would understand that Jesus is the Son of God. He came to die for their sins. That he was buried in the grave and rose from the dead to give us life everlasting. And, oh, Father God, if we would but believe and receive him as our Savior... We receive the payment for our sins. We could have eternal life. Let them pray something like this and, and mean it in their heart. Dear Jesus, I know I am a sinner. I know I was born that way. I realize that you, the Son of God, came to die for my sins. That the wages of sin is death. I know that death is coming, but Jesus died for my sins and he rose from the dead to give me the promise of eternal life. And I believe this. I repent of my sins and start wanting to walk with Jesus. Oh, Lord, help me. I promise you, come into my heart 
and I will serve you the rest of my life. Come into my heart and give me eternal life. And Jesus, again, to the best of my abilities, I'll live the rest of my life for you. Thank you, Jesus. As we continue in prayer, Father God, if there are anyone who prayed that prayer, let them make that personal by sharing it with someone nearby, a family member, a friend, or, or even, even in a church service like tonight. They might come forward and make that public profession. And, oh, Father God, be with us tonight. Place the joy of heaven in our hearts. Give us that joy of the journey, Father, that we might know that this narrow road is leading to the place where Jesus is. Give us strength and give us encouragement for this week yet ahead. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday. Bless me.